I'd like to introduce you to two incredible professors, Professor Luda Bard and Dr. Catherine Jones. Professor Luda Bard received her undergraduate degree in chemistry and biochemistry from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and earned a master's degree in applied molecular biology. Following graduation, she worked at John Hopkins University in the psychiatry department, studying schizophrenia. She started teaching at HCC in 2003 and became a full-time faculty member in 2007. She currently teaches and is course coordinator for a number of courses, including fundamentals of microbiology, genetics, genetics lab, cell biology, biology for engineers, and computational biology. She currently is co-chair of the Council for Curriculum Integrity. Dr. Katherine Jones received her undergraduate degree in biology from the University of Pennsylvania and earned a master's and PhD in genetics from Albert Einstein College of Medicine. She then worked for 30 years as a scientist doing basic research on HIV and related viruses, spending the last 20 years as a principal scientist at National Cancer Institute she joined HCC as an adjunct professor five years ago and is currently teaching genetics, genetics lab, and cell biology. She also consults for BioInteractive, a not-for-profit organization which provides materials to help educators teach biology. Now can you please give me a round of applause for these professors? Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our nice SET, beautiful uh, building. Um, tonight, tonight, I'm going to be talking to you about some exciting ad advances that have happened over the last 15 years in genetics. And in particular, I'm going to talk to you about some new genetic tests and how they're changing medicine and also going to can provide you with, uh, with uh, more information about who your ancestors are. So um, wait a second. Who are you? Hi, everybody. I am from the future. I actually teach in this classroom in 2068. And, um, you know, I was teaching genetics, and my students asked me about genome sequencing, and I figured, ah, you know, I might as well come here in 2018, right? So I used this masks time machine, and, uh, uh, you know, here I am. Wow, 20. 68, that's 50 years from now. What's HCC like in 50 years? Ah, uh, you know, same, old. <laughs> uh, I guess uh, I'm not wearing them, but bell bottoms came back. Uh, yeah. uh, Patty Turner is still our dean. <laughs> uh, and uh, Trump is still the president. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, and the students are much younger. You guys. No, these aren't actually our, st never mind. Okay, so <laughs> since you're here from the future, I was just going to tell them about DNA and genes and how they provide the instruction manual for life. But since you're here from the future, why don't you start off? And okay, here is the molecule of DNA. And this is your blueprint and really an instructional manual for all of your cells. You have this instructional manual in all of your cells and all of the living organisms have DNA inside. And... It starts with your mother's egg that is joined by your father's sperm, and then you have a fertilized egg that has DNA molecule in it, and when the cell goes through cellular divisions, which is basically like making copies, uh, making exact copies of the cell, they also replicate the exact copy of your DNA. So at the end of this, you have many cells. Each cell will contain the same instruction manual. And then eventually, and you have to wait for it, nine months, you will have a baby. Uh, and so uh, inside of this baby, you have cells. Inside of all of those cells, instruction manual that gives instructions for the cell. So for example, uh, the instruction manual inside of all of your cells will give you instructions for your heart to beat, for your eyes to see, and send a message to your brain for your ears to receive signals, and then they will go uh, also into your brain. So all of that is done via DNA. All right, so the, the fancy term that we're going to use for the collection of all of the DNA is going to be genome. Can you guys say genome? 
Dino. Excellent. You guys are a great audience. All right. Uh, so, and usually DNA molecules are found on chromosomes. So I will not make you repeat that. You did well with genome. OK. So um, just like any instruction manual is composed of letters. In English language, we have 26. I'm from Russia. How many letters are in Russian alphabet? Oh, good. How many? 33, you got my last machine. <laughs> Yay. Very nice. Good job. All right, so in the language of DNA, we have only four, A, T, C, and G. And to just give you a little bit of perspective, in our genome, we have three billion of those letters. And again, to just put it in perspective, it's like counting all of the letters in Harry Potter series and multiplying it times 800. And this slide, of course, came from Dr. Jones because in 2068, there are many more Harry Potter books. <laughs> so, um, okay, so how do we do all of this? Well, in DNA, we have segments that we call genes. And these segments will code for specific molecules that actually do some work inside of the cells. And those molecules are called proteins. So the proteins are being made by reading the sequence of those letters. And then based on the sequence of letters, we will put amino acids that are going to build a protein. And once the protein is made, just like a long thread of amino acids, they don't stay like this. They actually do fold and form very specific three-dimensional structure. And this three-dimensional structure comes from the sequence of those amino acids. And it's very, very specific depending on the letters inside of the genes. So for every gene, there will be a protein with specific shape and size and of course, that shape and size will determine the function. OK, so based on how you guys look, I'll try to make it a little bit easier. So you guys know Legos, right? We still play them, right? Yeah, in 2068, too. Kids are crazy about them. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the Lego, the instructions for the Legos, you follow the instructions. You take a specific Lego piece, it's a certain color, you put it in a certain order, and then you have a truck, okay? The same way we read a gene, based on what we read, we're going to take amino acid of specific type, we're going to put it into the thread of amino acids, and then at the end of this all, we're going to get a protein, okay? Now, you could imagine that if you don't follow instructions well, or there's something wrong with the instructions, for example, instead of the wheels, if I were to place these brown thingies, then your truck is no longer functional. The same way, if you put a wrong amino acid in your protein because you have a wrong A, T, C, or G in your DNA, you will not get the shape that you really need for the properly functional protein, okay? So a classic example of this uh, is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein that carries oxygen throughout the blood, and uh, one of the parts of the hemoglobin is beta-globin, and this is uh, a, a protein that is very important for hemoglobin to function. So if there is a change in the letters, you can see the highlighted area. You see that there is an A in the uh, mutant beta globin, the mistake, where there's supposed to be a T. So if that mistake was made, the protein is no longer folded correctly. And when the protein is no longer folded correctly, it cannot function. And if you have two copies of those variants, you don't have a properly functional hemoglobin and your red blood cells look like sickles. This is a sickle cell disease. In 2068, we fixed it all before babies are born. Okay, so don't worry. Bright future there. So for about 75 years, we've already known what you spoke of before, that DNA consists of A, T's, C's, and G's. 
And we knew that it had a code and it could make proteins, and that proteins made who we are. But until recently, we didn't have any way to read it. When we, when we looked at a piece of DNA, we didn't know what it said. About 1980, a technique was developed called sequencing. When you have sequencing, you can take a little piece of DNA and look at it, and using a special machine, you can read A, T, G, G, C, and then you can decode it and know what kind of protein is encoded by those genes. That was about 1980. Um, about five, eight years after that, a group at the National Institutes of Health nearby here in, in, in Bethesda decided to start on an ambitious project to sequence all of the three billion bases in the human genome, to read all those letters. Now, for a biologist, this was our version of trying to get a man on the moon. It was a huge, ambitious project that we barely had the tools for, but we were gonna try to do. And so what these guys did was, they called it the Human Genome Project, and they got literally thousands of scientists around the world to help them with this huge project. They went to 20 different institutions at six different countries, and they had people to start to, to sequence the genome. The first problem they had was they could only sequence a few hundred base pairs at a time. And, and the genome is three billion base pairs. So the first thing they had to do is chop it up into about 100 million pieces. And not only that, they had to know like a jigsaw puzzle how to put the pieces back together when they were finished. That took about five years, and then they started to actually sequence all of those 100 million little pieces. So around this time, there was a, another man, a man by the name of Craig Venter, who was a, a businessman and scientist, who thought that he might be able to finish the job, since the, the National Institutes of Health and the consortium had published this data to the world, he thought with those, since he'd done the hard part, sort of, that he might be able to beat them and get credit for, with his company, for sequencing the human genome. So there started this huge race, and in 2003, the Human Genome Project published the first sequence of, of uh, the entire human genome. And the next day, Craig Venter and Solera Genomics, his company, published it as well. So both men, does anyone remember this? It was a pretty big deal at the time, right? You guys remember this? And so not only did they get their faces on the cover of Time Magazine, but they were invited to the White House to celebrate, and they shared the fame. So you may be wondering, who was the first person to get their genome sequenced? So the first person for the Human Genome Project was James Watson. Anyone heard of Watson and Crick, right? So James Watson was the, um, one of the co-discoverers of the double helix, uh, double helix of DNA. And Solera Genomics, their first person sequenced was the CEO, <laughs> so, right? So um, now you might be wondering, Professor Bard and anyone, if we've known how to sequence the sequence of the human genome for 15 years, why are you just starting to hear about genetic tests in the last few years? The reason for that, like so many things in life, is cost. If you had gotten your genome sequenced 10 years ago, in 2008, it would have cost you about a million dollars. And the cost has gone down precipitously since then to the point when you can now sequence a genome for just a few, th few thousand dollars. So another thing you might be wondering is um, what we found out when we started decoding the genome when we read our instruction manual. And I can say as a person who got her degree in genetics before this all happened, there were a lot of surprises. And one of them was when we compared, we started sequencing the genome of other organisms who were close to us, we found out that we were way more closely related to these other groups than we'd previously believed. So our cl closest relative is a chimpanzee. And when we looked at our genome, we were 99% identical to the genome of, of a, a human. So, meaning, of course, that means that it's only one out of 100 base pairs are different between us and chimpanzees. With orangutans, we're about 98% the same. Bonobos, we're also 99% the same. And even with things like mice, the areas, the genes themselves, are very similar, which makes sense if you think about that we've used some of those animals as, as model organisms for, for ours. Another thing we found out that was very surprising is when scientists were able to get DNA from a 38,000-year-old body of a Neanderthal that they found in a cave in Europe. 
So one of the things we found out, and this was a shock, was that many of us in this room have Neanderthal DNA in our genome. So how did, how did that happen? Why was that a surprise? We knew that Neanderthals lived at the same time as our early humans, early Homo sapiens, but we thought that we were different species, like a horse and a zebra, that we couldn't mate and have children. Well, it turns out we must have because a lot of us have Neanderthal DNA. So who in, in, in the room thinks that they might have Neanderthal DNA? Everyone raising their hand is right, because probably just about, because really everyone who isn't purely African in their ancestry. So the, the uh, are, do have Neanderthal DNA. And that's because, you know, um, um, humans, uh, Homo sapiens started in, in Africa. When we came out of Africa and moved into Europe, that's where the Neanderthals were. So everyone in this room who's Asian or, or European in their ancestry has about two or three percent Neanderthal DNA. Another surprise came when we started looking, when we did more and more sequences, and they did the genomes of a lot of different humans around the world. We found out that it's not surprising that people are different from one another. I told you that we're 99% the same as a chimp, so maybe it's not surprising we're 99.9% .9 the same as each other. But what was a surprise was the places where we were different. So it used to be believed, we used to believe when I got my genetics degree, that those differences would just be scattered around the genome. And it turns out that's not true. Nearly everyone in the world has the same letter in the same place, almost everywhere in your genome. So we all have a G and we all have a T and we all have a T, uh, G, T, G, and then you'll get to a place where some of us have a C and some of us have a T. And even though that difference is just one out of 1,000 base pairs, it can make a big difference in how you turn out. So these differences are called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. So that's uh, SNPs, you might have heard of these. And how it winds up is if you look around the world, maybe most people have an A, but there's a significant number of people, like 5% who have a T, or maybe 12% who have a G. So looking at Americans and Europeans, they got a feeling for these differences, but it wasn't until they started to go around the world and sequence the genome of people whose ancestors had always lived in that place that they started to figure out what was going on. So it turns out if you look around the world, you find out that nearly everyone with a T is from Scandinavia or Northern Europe. And everyone with a G, let's say, is from Asia. So how did that happen? Right? Professor Bard told you that when we start off as a baby, right, when a cell divides, the DNA in that cell, that genome, also has to make an exact copy of itself and pass it on to the next generation. Very, very rarely, mistakes are made. Even more rarely, a mistake ma happens in a cell that winds up becoming a sperm or an egg. So if a long time ago in a Norwegian village, Somebody had, um, a man had a mutation when he was making sperm, and now they had a T there instead of an A, a mistake was made during the copying. Now, they would give that to their child, and every cell in that child would then have the T. Now, back in those days, 20,000 years ago, you kind of tended to marry your cousin, or at least someone in the village, right? And so then everyone in that village, or many people, would wind up getting a T. So eventually that would spread, and so you'd see a region of the world now that most people there have a T, whereas most people in the world have, other people have an A. And by this, I would then say the same thing happened in what is now China, let's say 50,000 years ago. So people there have a G. So now, if you just look at one of these, you can't tell. There's enough variation. But if you looked at hundreds, or if you looked at thousands of them, at these SNPs, at these places where we're different, you could tell where a person is from. And that's exactly what those genetic tests you probably have seen advertised, that's what they're doing. They're looking at hundreds or thousands of your SNPs, and then they're get from that guessing where you're from. Has anyone in the audience had one of these done to determine their ancestry? Wow, that's cool. Any big surprises? Don't tell me, don't. Okay. Um, so that's exactly, and that's why when you get the data, for those of you who've done it, you get something like this, right? Because that's what they're telling you. They're just telling you, you have the SNPs, that are like the people who live in those places, whose ancestors came from those places in the world, right? So 
Professor Bard talk, told you earlier about genes. So most of these SNPs are not in genes. She showed you there's genes along, along the genome, along the DNA in the genome, and there's spaces in between. And it turns out there's big spaces, and a lot of people, most SNPs don't have any effect on us at all, because they're not in the part of the genome that codes for a protein. They're in the places in between. We just use them as a measure to tell, to, to find out information. There's a few of them that are in genes. One of them in Europeans, people of European ancestry, there's a, one place that codes for a protein that determines hair development. And if you have an A, you're going to have straight hair. And if you have a T, you're going to have curly hair. And another place, they recently found out, they knew there was one that would definitely tell people from Europe, from people from, from Africa, and that's inside a gene that codes for skin color. It's one of the major ones that co codes for skin color. And the re so the reason that people in different parts of the world have different skin color is because of variation SNPs in coding regions for proteins that are important in making the color of our skin. So as I told you for the other thousand base pairs or so, almost everyone has the exact same genome, but it's sequence in their genome. But that's almost everyone, but not everyone. So there's many, many places in genes where we almost all have the A that made, makes the truck with the wheels, right? But a few of us have a T that has the blocks on the Lego thing instead, right? That has an incorrectly folded protein instead of a correctly folded protein. And those are the ones that can cause disease. So now we're getting to the part about what we can do in 2018 and how this is affecting medical care. You can go to a doctor and they can test you for some of, some of these genes and find out if you have the normal protein or the protein that, might, that would lead to disease. And one example of how this is happening, and I think many of you might be surprised to hear this, in every newborn baby in America is tested before they leave the hospital for certain genetic diseases. And here in Maryland, we're actually doing a lot of that. Here's a pamphlet that the parents get when they have the newborn babies before they leave the hospital. We test for mutations in 58 different genes. So what they're doing is they're just getting a bit of the baby's blood. They're looking for these changes and seeing if they have certain diseases. Now, they don't test for every disease. They're only testing for diseases that might cause a physical impairment or intellectual disability. But if you cut them early enough, you could prevent the disease or even at least make it less than it would be if, if you didn't know about it. So the babies are getting tested specifically for, for, for the presence of a disease that they could do something about if they intervene early. And for some of these, it's as simple as keeping a diet, not taking a certain amino acid. You can have a normal life instead of being uh, mentally disabled. So it's a really remarkable thing we're doing now. So that's an example of what genetics is doing now that it wasn't doing 10 years ago. So I'm, I'm really curious about the treatment. So how many of you were prescribed a medication uh, by a doctor that was not effective? You had to go back to your doctor and get a different medication. And that medication had, let's say, side effects. And then you go back to your doctor and you get prescribed yet another medication. And raise your hands. Just curious. Yeah. Okay, so what you experience is called traditional medicine, uh, which is uh, basically when uh, we think we develop a drug that works on a lot of people, uh, and uh, for some of the people it is either not effective or it has horrible side effects. But we are okay with that because it works in some, and so the doctors feel that eventually they will find the drug that will work for you by trial and error. Um, even though there is a, a wonderful thing that we, actually in 2018 you guys have a little bit of what is known as personalized medicine. Uh, I experienced that when I got my glasses, right? When you go to a glass doctor, your eye doctor, you get your specific prescription. They don't give you a generic pair, right? So we hope that very, very shortly, very soon, you will experience what's known as personalized medicine, which is uh, basically you go to the doctor, you get genetic tests done, 
And based on your SNPs, based on your variants of your genes, we prescribe medications. And these medications work for you, on you, and they work from the first time because it's based on genetic evidence rather than let us guess and hope. So just to give you a little bit of statistics um, so you understand about uh, traditional medicine, if you look on this slide, you can see that um, basically almost more than 50% of the patients who receive drugs for arthritis, Alzheimer's, and cancer do not find these drugs effective. So with traditional medicine, we give one type of drug to all of the patients. This drug works on some, does not work at all on others, and causes terrible side effects on the third group. We learned that this is partially due to one gene that is called cytochrome P450. You guys don't need to remember that. But this codes for a protein that removes drugs and toxins from your system. So some of us have very effective, very well working protein that removes drugs from the system fast, which makes drugs not effective because it's removed before it has a chance to work. Others have a normal working protein, and so the drug has some time to work in the system. And others have very, very slow working protein. So the drug stays in the system, becomes a toxin for your system, and causes terrible side effects. So it would be great if we could do genetic testing, find out what type of cytochrome P450 you have, and based on that, not only we could determine what type of drug you could have, but also we could determine the dose. So for example, if you have a, a P450 that is slowly removing the drugs from your system, well, doctors, tell me what you're gonna do. Have the dose, right? Reduce the dose, very good. Or if you have a protein that works super fast and removes the drug before it could be effective, what, what are you gonna do? Increase the dose, yeah, and all of that based on your genetic information, okay? Um, of course, we can apply similar approach to many fields of medicine. In psychiatry, for example, um, we have problems with feeling anxious or depressed. And so let me tell you why people feel depressed or anxious. You guys probably know that the signal travels from one cell to the other, and the signal, when it travels, for it to go from one cell to the other in your brain, you need to release certain molecules that we call neurotransmitters, more specifically, serotonin. You feel calm and happy when you have a lot of serotonin molecules in between those two cells. Once the signal was passed to the next cell, serotonin molecules sent back to the cell that originally sent them out, okay? If you don't have serotonin between the two cells, you feel depressed and sad and anxious. For some of us, the reuptake, the taking the serotonin molecules back is actually too efficient. The, the, the molecules that work really well for taking the serotonin back into the original cell is too fast. And so there are not enough serotonin molecules in between the two cells. Well, we develop drugs to fix that. And the drug basically blocks the molecules that send the serotonin back so that, like Prozac on this picture, blocks the molecule that sends the serotonin back, serotonin stays between the two cells longer, and you're no longer depressed or anxious. We could apply the same personalized medicine approach to doing genetic tests and finding out why exactly we have psychiatric problems, what neurotransmitters are missing, what is the mechanism and address exactly that rather than trying to guess which drug will work for you. We do have these genetic tests. Doctors, psychiatrists, and other therapists are starting to use these. 
So this whole group, you know about, these are called SSRIs. You might have heard that word. Those are the ones, like she just showed, that block the uptake back in the cell. So Prozac, Zoloft, they're all doing the same thing. But different, different ones work slightly differently. And so people are doing genetic tests so they don't have to have the things of trying the drug for eight weeks and then seeing it doesn't work and trying another one. So one of the other areas right now that we have, are just starting and really holds a lot of promise is, is cancer drugs. Because I'm sure there's probably not a person in this room who doesn't know only too well that even if someone gets a treatment for cancer, it often doesn't work. And the reason for that has to do with because each person's cancer is a little different. So to understand this, I just have to talk a second about, about how normal cells divide and what cancer is. So cancer is when a cell divides without stopping. And in a normal cell, a ce most cells in our body aren't dividing most of the time. If they get a certain signal, they will divide, but then they'll stop dividing. If they don't get the signal anymore, they won't divide anymore. We have about 150 different genes that control that. And if one of them's wrong, you're okay. So they control the fact that a cell is supposed, when it stops dividing, it stops dividing, it doesn't keep dividing. We have about 150 different genes. We know almost all of them now. And those genes, if maybe you have four or five or six of them that aren't functioning anymore, because they have a mutation, the protein isn't working correctly, you now no longer can stop the dividing and you get a cell that divides without stopping. So one of the, an example of how we're making improvements and we're gonna even continue into the future is breast cancer. So in breast cancer 40 years ago, if you had breast cancer, you had breast cancer. They treated it in a way that helped the most, the highest percentage of the patients, which was uh, chemotherapy and radiation, but still uh, a lot of people died. About um, 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, doctors and scientists started looking at individual people's breast cancer tumors to see if they could tell them apart. And they learned that they could divide them into three different groups, three different subtypes, based on certain proteins that were on the cell surface. So again, if you know someone who's had a cancer, you might have heard these words, HER2 positive, ER positive, or triple negative. And it turns out in each one of those, you have a different set of proteins that aren't functioning correctly. And, by, and it turns out that for each one of them, there's a different treatment that treats that kind of cancer the best. So for each one of these different, nowadays people get their breast cancer tumors subtyped and they're treated specifically for the changes that are in their tumor. All right, and this is, uh, so now, We've gone to the next step. Now that we can sequence the genome, we're starting to look in an individual's cancer for more genes to understand better which genes are broken, and so you can know which ones to target in the cancer therapy. So in this case, I want to make, this isn't sequencing your genome. It's actually often sequencing your genome and then the cancer cells genome, it's called a cancer genome, and you're looking for the differences so you can tell what it is in your cancer that's causing it to be a cancer cell so you can target that better. And uh, one of the first people who had this done was Steve Jobs when he was dying of cancer. He actually paid to have his own genome and his tumor sequenced with hope that it would help others in the future. One of the best places in the world I have to say for this is Johns Hopkins. They've been one of the leaders and they're still one of the best people in the world and we're learning a lot from that. So that's just one example and of, of personalized medicine that's just starting now and, and I think we'll be improving uh, medical treatments in the future. So up to now when we were talking about sickle cell disease or these cancers, we're talking about changes that actually directly cause a disease. And when we talked about the newborn baby screening, it was showing that if you had a certain genetic change, you had a defective protein, which would mean you would have the disease. But for thousands of years, as you can see from this Chinese text, doctors have been trying to take it back a step. Wouldn't it be good if we could prevent a disease instead of just treating diseases? So this is the next stage of genetics and something that I think most people in this room will have tested in five or 10 years for some of these things. 
So an example is cancer. There are cancer genes. So you've probably heard, oh, those people have cancer runs, breast cancer runs in their family, you know, lung cancer runs in their family for different families. It turns out that we now have identified a number of the proteins that make a person more likely to develop a cancer. So this is just a screenshot from one of the companies it's used that doctors are using now. So they don't test everyone with this. They test people who think they have a certain cancer in their family to see if they have one of these genes. Now again, this is different from what we talked about before. If you have one of these genes, it doesn't mean you will get cancer. It means you're much more likely to get cancer than other people. And, and so you can imagine though, along with you, your behavior and along working with your doctor, if you knew you were gonna be more likely than someone to get colorectal cancer, you could do all that stuff like eat a high fiber diet and uh, eat lots of fruits and vegetables and the stuff you're supposed to do to try to reduce your chances. You also probably wouldn't put off your colonoscopy and you would probably get, and you would get it, in, that's what people do, they do it like every two years or so and then remove polyps so that they can't become cancerous. Same thing, if you knew you were more likely to get lung, dis, uh, lung cancer, you probably would have a lot of motivation for quitting smoking. Probably the most famous cancer gene, one of some of you might have heard of, is called BRCA1. So individuals with BRCA1, women with BRCA1, are, have about a 50-50 chance of getting breast cancer by the time they're 70, and that's as opposed to uh, women who have a normal gene in BRCA1 who don't have the mutation, where it's about 12%. And this was, uh, attention to this one has been brought um, by Angelina Jolie because she actually has a mutation in her gene. Her mother died when she was 50, and at the time she had a lot of small kids, so she decided to go get herself tested. And when she did, she found out that not only did she have a mutation in BRCA1, but she had one of the worst versions, one of the worst mutations, so she had an 85% chance of getting breast cancer by the time she was 70. And so she decided to have a prophylactic double mastectomy, which reduces your chances to almost zero because you don't have any breast cancer, breast cells anymore that could become cancerous, right? So she was very out about this. She did an editorial in the New York Times and she's been, um, she's done a lot to raise awareness for BRCA1 and to encourage testing in people who have a history of breast cancer in their family. So that's about where we are in 2018, but I'm pretty curious to see what's going to happen in, in, in the next 50 years. Yeah, Once the you, uh, finish future up. is really bright. There certainly will be a lot of gene editing uh, is happening right now, and it will be developing uh, at greater pace. A lot of the prenatal uh, diagnosis will take place, and genome sequencing is going to go to the next level. So uh, you probably saw this on Google News. Well, this is uh, very cool, and this is called a Minion. And this is a small machine that allows you to go to your doctor, get a sample of your DNA, and to test your entire genome sequence right then and there. By plugging it in to your laptop, you can put DNA through the little tube, a channel, and every letter, A, T, C, and G, oh, I should have asked you guys that, um, <laughs> goes through this test tube, and it has a different current that could be read by this machine. And right there, at your doctor, you could get your entire genome sequence. Now, do not confuse that with 23andMe, okay? That test that you can get for however many dollars right now, that tests only segments of your DNA. This can test your entire genome. And it would be very nice if by using that information, your doctor could actually prescribe personalized medication, right? And figure out your treatment based on your genetic makeup. So, of course, all of that will require a lot of ethical discussions, political discussions uh, that will happen by 2068. Thank you, Luna and Kathy. Thank you, guys. It was nice being in 2018.